As a branding specialist, it's my job to extract the story, if it hasn't already been done so, from my customer in order to write almost like a fairy tale that their customers can relate to, empathize with, and ultimately buy into their offering. This time, however, it's my turn to tell my story. So I'm in my mid-teens and my mother invites this old lady around the house and she was a seamstress and she was there to take up my trousers to get my uniform ready for school. After she introduced herself, somehow she ended up telling me all about her family and even started to give her entire life story. Now, I kid you not, it was so boring. It was bringing tears to my eyes and I eventually, halfway through, started to nod off and not only was I nodding off I looked over at my mother and my mother is nodding off but I'm still trying desperately to listen to this story and not appear rude but I think the straw that broke the camel's back was the next minute I looked up and she is starting to fall asleep so we woke her up and of course we said oh well you know it's getting late isn't it about time you left and she said oh I'm ever so sorry she said your house is so warm so comfy I'm starting to doze off the reason why I'm telling you this is, of course, I'm giving my story today, but I promise you, anything that is going to put you to sleep, I will edit out early. Looking back, I would say that by the time I was 10 years of age, in the mid 80s, I knew for sure that I would want, when I grew up, not to be a fireman, but to have something to do with computers. I mean, this was the mid 80s. You think about it, we had Knight Rider, Battlestar Galactica, we had war games. Shall we play a game? Oh. War games, very important film for the introduction of the seriousness of computers. I mean, this was uh, quite an exciting time. And uh, even Superman 3, Superman 3 showed us that if you were some kind of computer hacker, you could take down Superman. I mean, how awesome is that? So yeah, from a very early age, I wanted something to do with computers. Didn't know what? Probably computer games back then. Commodore 64, Amstrad CPC 464. Yeah, it was probably to do with computer games, but back then, it was almost the other way around. If you wanted to get into computers and you say to your family, oh, I'm thinking of getting into computers, then they'd probably advise maybe you should study business or finance as something to fall back on. Whereas today, if you want to be some kind of serial entrepreneur, your family is probably going to recommend, well, why don't you study computer science to fall back on? So yeah, things are definitely different now to when I was a kid. We're rolling on a few years. I would say that as far as web development was concerned, I didn't really get involved until the mid-90s. 1996, uh, as I say, computers for me was more of a hobby. I was into software development. I had my own bulletin board, if you're old enough to remember what a bulletin board is. But in 96, a very good friend of mine who owned an engineering firm, he asked me to have a look at his website. He said, oh, you know, something to do with computers. He knew that I was working at the time um, in the auto electronics sphere. And he said, please, we've had this company. They are not exactly cheap, particularly expensive things were very expensive to do with the internet in those days. They've created this website. It's not finished. It's taking a little bit longer than we expected. Uh, I just want someone else to have a look at it to make sure we're getting our money's worth. Well, I had to look at this website. It wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, it was definitely overpriced. And I have a particularly uh, black humor, especially where my friends are concerned. So I basically explained that, yes, it's underachieving, if one for a better description. And I gave him a list of all of the things that could be done in order to salvage it, something that could bring it up to speed and something that would give the website something to do as opposed to just being literally an electronic brochure. That's all it was. Well, after giving him this list and having a bit of a laugh and explaining what I would have done, he said, well, why don't you actually do it then? And uh, I wasn't so keen. This was something for me at the time that was more of a hobby, but uh, with the type of character this guy has, he gave me an incentive. He said, I tell you what, do it, have some fun, 
and if it's better than what I currently have and you finish it first, I will pay you double. So the challenge was on and uh, I pulled out all of the stops. We didn't have PHP back then, or I think we did. I think PHP came out. I remember doing some research slightly after I started getting into PHP. So I think PHP came out in 94. I didn't use PHP in 96. In those days, I was using a different scripting language, which was called Perl, which still allowed you to query databases and everything else. And it was easier for me to learn and get access to resources. So, so I used Perl. And uh, yeah, I finished it. And uh, he did pay me double. He then rang a colleague of his in front of me saying, hey, do you still need this website doing? Because if you do, I have a Wicked Web Designer for you. And that's how I ended up with the trading name Wicked Web Designer. It was unofficial for many years. This is the Wicked Web Designer. But eventually it became the name of my company. The next website I did again was for an engineering firm. And this was fantastic for me because whenever you're in web development and you have to work for completely different types of company, there is a learning curve there. You've got to learn about different types of businesses, how they function, what they do, why they do it the way they do, and are there ways of automating it to make the entire process easier and better for the realms of the internet. After doing a few websites for engineering, I was getting a little bit bored. I wanted to move on. And I also wanted to create websites with additional functionality. I can't remember where I got it from now, but there was a logistics firm at a local airport. They had some kind of contract with LG International and they needed a stock control system. But this stock control system, they needed to have the data available online, little tables with inventory on. And uh, we needed to make that accessible on the internet. And we found a way of doing it by synchronizing databases and uh, everything was fine. But you have to remember in these days, this was not something that was being done on a regular basis. And we had to sort of work out how to do things as we went along. So yeah, things moved on. I was working on particularly interesting projects, but this was more of a sideline. It didn't really move on to something substantial until years later. Now I tried to open a web development firm three times before I was successful. Now it wasn't not successful for normal reasons like a, a company is not making any money. It's because as soon as I did the marketing, which gave me a name, I would be headhunted from my own company. Now, resources in my industry was not as prevalent as it is today. So we had situations where if somebody decided I would fit the bill to work in their company on a long-term project, they would headhunt me. And I remember the first project lasted maybe six or seven months. I literally down-tooled from my one-man band operation. In actual fact, these days, if you find someone who can do the design, the coding and everything else, we call these guys full stack. So you could say I was a full stacker way back then. Now, the mid-90s to, should we say, 2000, the dawn of our new millennium, if you will, internet business was very, very different. I remember when I first wanted to put an advert in the Yellow Pages, we didn't even have the category internet web designer yet. The only category we could have was for internet services. And you would be tucked away in between all of the web hosting companies and server farms. In actual fact, I don't even think server farms were a big thing back then either. They might not have even had a category either. But advertising on the internet itself was much easier. I don't think Google existed when I first started. It was definitely before the millennium, probably about 98 when a Google came on the scene. Before then we had uh, Yahoo. Yahoo was a big thing. Uh, there were quite a few search engines at the time. I remember there was a Canadian one called Mama.com, which wasn't really a search engine in its own right, but it would compile all of the search results from different search engines into one search string. And so it gave you hopefully what they considered at the time, the best of both worlds. We didn't even have to worry about keyword density at the beginning either. I remember we had a computer program, which was called web position gold. And you would literally put all of the uh, keywords in that you wanted within the search results. And Bob's your uncle within a few weeks, you would be where you wanted to. Now, unfortunately, there were a few unscrupulous companies out there, predominantly selling Viagra who would take advantage of this. And it was the likes of Google when they eventually came on the scene that did something about that, which of course made our lives a little bit more difficult. But rightly so. I mean, at the end of the day, when you search on the internet, you expect the content that you view to be relevant to what you're searching for. Now, back then we didn't have many customers come to us directly. 
I would say the majority of customers that came to us directly were new companies, startups. Between the mid 90s to 2000, this was what we called the dot com boom. And a lot of the customers that came to us directly, the conversion rate from doing all of the hard work with the proposal to actually converting into a customer was particularly low. And this is when it was brought to my attention after looking into it a bit more that these customers were using all of our research that we were putting the proposal together with as part and parcel of their business plan. And if they didn't get the funding, they wouldn't take it any further. So it was a lot of work for next to nothing. So what I did to get around that was I started charging for my proposals. And if they did come back and give us the project, I would deduct the cost that we were charging of the proposal from the final price of the finished product. So for a few years, I was actually making more money writing proposals for projects we didn't actually do and what venture capitalists called due diligence. That's right, I had venture capitalists paying me to read other people's business plans, not from a business perspective, but from a technologist perspective, if you will, to say whether what the company was suggesting was possible is actually possible. So yes, very, very unusual time. I made more money reading about the work, writing about the work than actually doing the work. And it was after 2000, probably about 2003, that I opened my company up for the third time because in around about 2000, I was headhunted again. I was the technical director for a company in Cheltenham, after which I decided this is it. It's now or never and decided to give it a third try. Well, between 2003 and 2007, everything went like clockwork. And at our very pinnacle, we had over 84 staff and were responsible for over 2,500 websites. 2007, however, were when things started to get difficult. I spent most of my time downsizing the company, weathering the storm, waiting for the financial crisis to end. So by about 2009, that's really when I had downsized my company until there was literally nothing left. And I was pretty much a freelancer. I was mainly working for media companies and marketing agencies and pretty much making ends meet. And this is when I realized looking back that the majority of the guys I was working with that we outsourced work to were in India. And the reason why they were able to be as cost effective as they were was because of the cost of living in the country was somewhat lower. Now this was way before digital nomads even existed. And laptops weren't particularly fast enough for you to be able to do the type of work I did and just literally work from country to country. But I did decide at this stage that I did want to travel the emerging markets and live in countries that were cheaper so that for the same money that would allow me to make ends meet back home, I would be able to live like a king. And for many years, it worked. I would say for the last 10 years, I've been able to, if I wanted to, eat out every night in a restaurant without worrying about looking at the prices on the menu. I mean, it is that much cheaper. Now, this was supposed to be short term. I thought I would do it for a couple of years and then go back home and then start the ball rolling all over again. But on reflection at that time, I realized that I had lost my 20s. I married particularly young at the age of 21. I was divorced by the age of 32, had little to nothing to show for it with compliments of this financial crisis. And I sure as hell wasn't going to lose my 30s. So I had this idea that between 2017 and 2019, when you think the financial crisis started in 2007, and I didn't really start traveling until 2009. That was where I wanted to be. By 2017, maybe I should go home, start running a business to get it ready for 2019. Or by 2019, I've had my decade of traveling, and then it's time to settle down, start a family, and run a normal business. Well, now is 2019. In 2017, I posted a mention on LinkedIn to say, hey, Darren is coming home. And if anyone has particular opportunities for me to look at, to not hesitate to give me a shout. And that's when I was recommended to go have a look at Uzbekistan again. It was one of the first countries I'd actually been to during this 10 year cycle of traveling. What I realized very quickly was that the way a particular company there that wanted to give me an opportunity was doing business was not perhaps the way I wanted to do business. And one thing I've learned very early on is before you criticize others, you need to make sure what you are doing is better. So I had a look at my idea for the business model and I wasn't particularly impressed. I thought, wow, this is particularly old hat. It doesn't really make sense anymore 
when you look at what the requirements are for my customer. So I had to look out there as to what best practice should be. And I was shocked. Technology has evolved. Everything has evolved. But the methodologies as to how we do things haven't. And it's about time we did. So I spent a couple of years working out how I want to do things. It's going to be particularly expensive, but it's going to be worthwhile. And I can do it bit by bit. It's not something I have to pay for all in one go. And that's where I am now. However, instead of releasing some kind of amazing story of how wonderful my journey was when I finished, and then charging everyone a monthly subscription to find out how you can make your millions. I mean, we've seen a couple of years ago, it was all about make your own course. Now it's all about social media. Well, for the last 10 years, a large part of my business has been social media, internet marketing. And I can tell you, it's not as easy as they say. So I'm going to document my story. I'm going to give as much advice to anybody who's interested in this type of business to be able to get involved. There is going to be no monthly subscription whatsoever, but if I monetize these videos on YouTube, hopefully it will make enough money to cover the costs of putting this together. And if it makes a profit, well, that's a bonus. Well, thank you for listening to my story. I hope you find it of interest. Talk to you again soon.